Keep it coming. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Right. right. Uh, Dr. Sinai, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, perfectly. Right. Okay. All the guests, uh, please welcome to the Islamic College, our monthly seminar. Uh, we are just about to start. I can see that the PowerPoint is already on. Okay. I'll just start straight away without uh, wasting any more time. And just a little introduction. So, Dr. Uh, Nikolai Sinai is a a PhD holder from the Free University of Berlin in 2007 and a fellow of, a, of the British Academy. He has imparted knowledge at the University of Oxford since 2011, now holding an esteemed position of Professor of Islamic Studies. His latest publication, Key Terms of the Quran, a critical dictionary published in 2023, exemplifies his scholarly endeavors. His presentation will dwell in Dr. Sinai's ongoing project, a historical and literary commentary of Surah of the Surah 1 to 3. His endeavor is part of a research project, Quran in Commentary and Integrative Paradigm, which has been running from, from October 2018 to March 2022-25. Will be running. I think I think it will, will, will complete by 2025. And this is a, a project with the support of, consor of a consortium of grants from the European Research Council. The discussion will encompass the foundation of hermeneutical principles, methodological approach, and the proposed structure and organization of the commentary. Without further ado, I will ask Dr. Sinai to, uh, to start his talk. Um, thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be invited. Um, um, I've been asked to speak for about 60 minutes, so that's what I'm going to do, but feel free to shut me up earlier. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll submit to whatever you... Um, sure, yes, um, we, have, we have 60 minutes for you. So okay. Um, so it, this is going to be a sort of workshop presentation, effectively, um, uh, on, on on the book that, that you've already um, alluded to. So um, a historical and literary commentary on at least Surahs 1 and 2. In my more ambitious moments, I've promised a commentary on Surahs 1 to 3 or even 1 to 5, I think, in the first version of the proposal. Uh, I, I think from where I'm standing now, it's... Um, just Surahs 1 and 2 alone are going to pan out at around 160,000 words. So I fear that anything beyond Surah 2 may need to become another book because um, there's plenty to say on the Quran. Um, and the book is meant to be um, my own main output in, in the context of the ERC project that, that you've alluded to, um, which has been running for a while, but was um, um, delayed by COVID. So we've been able to get an extension on that. So we're actually still, still up and running. Um, um, so in writing that commentary, I began with the Fatiha, which is of course less than 30 words. And, um, and and fairly quickly, um, I ended up with a very sort of unwieldy kind of mini monograph because uh, I felt I needed to discuss. Um, Are we okay? No, I, right. Um, I I I um. I felt I needed to say something on the meaning and um, etymology and function of um. Various key terms that, that figure in the Fatiha, Rahman, Rabbil Alameen, Yawmadeen, even Allah. Um, um, and at, at some point, I just decided this isn't looking like a commentary anymore. Um, so I took these excursuses out. Um, I bit the bullet. I um, um, sort of wrote a different um, book that um, is effectively a preliminary work to the commentary. That's been out for about six months now. Um, sort of discursive dictionary of key terms of the Quran, and I'm now back on the commentary um, with about 30 more verses of uh, Surah al-Baqarah to go. Um, so I'd like to make use of this talk to just share some of my thinking around what I'd like the commentary to do and, and to look like, and also hopefully to come away with useful criticism um, and a renewed sense of purpose, maybe. Um, I'd like to begin by expressing my basic conviction that um, a commentary really is the ultimate literary format for interpreting an ancient text, especially a canonical text. Um, um, despite the fact that, that commentaries have undoubtedly fallen out of favor as a format of writing in contemporary academia. So I think there's some 
very interesting um, recent research in Islamic studies on um, commentaries written in the pre-modern periods, but it's generally not the case that contemporary academics write commentaries. Um, um, and I really like them. Um, one reason for that is, I think a commentary format just makes it very clear um, that what you're doing is supposed to be subservient or ancillary to, to the main text. So you play second fiddle. Um, you are less important than the main text. Um, you ought to know your place. Um, secondly, a commentary uh, does force one to confront the entire text, or at least the entirety of whatever passage of it you've decided to comment upon. Um, you can't just silently pass over those parts that make little sense to you or in which, on which you may initially feel you don't really have much to say. Um, so, so by its nature, commentarial reading is, is non-selective, um, whereas the two preferred formats of modern academia, arguably, in the, the journal article and the thematic monograph, require one to predefine very um, precisely, narrowly, what, what topic uh, you, you're proposing to write on, and, and that you selectively pull together um, primary and secondary literature around those topics. Um, so one, one might call these these two formats, um, the journal article and the monograph, static um, types of, of writing. And um, insofar as you, you pursue one principal claim, one principal argument, and by contrast to that, good commentary writing is inherently Reporting the, the governing focus. Yeah, right. Oh, thank, thank you, iPhone. <laughs> um, appreciate it. Um, so a good commentary writing is uh, inherently unthetic, non-thetic, because the, government, the, the governing focus ought to be simply on the primary text. Um, um, so commentaries can be tightly focused without being tightly focused and in a way limited by a particular claim or argument. Um, and the third reason for why I like commentaries is precisely um, because the structure of a commentary, so simple and predictable, so you just tag along the main text, the, the main text essentially, um, a, commentary, a commentary can very conveniently, I think, open up a forum, a space where different observations and methods of analysis can come together, can, can consort and cross-fertilize in a, in a spontaneous, un, unpremeditated fashion, which um, is an issue to which I, I'm going to return later. Um, so maybe one example for that, um, um, in commenting on the um, um, Abraham passages in Surat al-Baqarah, I might notice that in connection with Abraham, uh, the Quran tends to speak of the Meccan sanctuary as a as a house, as a bait, rather than Hello. as a bait. Um, and, uh, hello. Okay. I sorry, these um <laughs> the voices on the background always terribly throw me off track. Um, um I'm gonna just skip that example. Let's um let's move on. So um commentaries are interesting because you can bring stuff together. Um in a personal capacity, I think that that really is what um interests me um as a scholar. Um I think there are many people out there who have far better Arabic or Syriac or Greek or who know far more than me about late antique religious history or Arabic grammar or Quranic manuscripts or Arabian epigraphy. Um, what I would hope the contribution of, of this book might be is to to connect observations and insights that might otherwise remain slightly locked in in their specific um, disciplinary realms. Um, my title describes the commentary I'm working on as a historical critical tafsir. So there's two components to that. Um, I, sh I should probably say a few words um, about what, I'm, what, what I mean by that. So let's take historical critical first. Um, as I've argued elsewhere, I mean, to me, the essence of taking a critical approach to a text is to, to bracket received and supposedly authoritative assumptions about the meaning and the genesis of that text and, and to subject them to careful and argument-based scrutiny. I mean, that's not original. I just uh, take that to be an explication of what we usually mean by the word. Um, I think in addition to, to that, a critical aspect, um, the critical aspect of historical criticism also usually entails suspending and postponing questions of theological truth. So a historical critical interpreter does not usually start out by asking what God is trying to tell us uh, in the Bible or in the Quran, um, even if, if he or she is himself or herself convinced that the Bible or the Quran are are indeed divine revelations, um, but that's not the starting point. Um, so instead, a historical critical interpreter will try to appreciate 
how a text fitted into or made sense in a particular historical context. And, and in so doing, a historical critical interpreter, um, I think it's safe to say, will generally rely on, on fairly commonsensical assumptions of historical probability that do not posit direct divine agency um, and that do not suppose that, that humans back then, as it were, were impelled by motives that are very different to ours. Um, now, this isn't a talk about historical criticism. Um, all of this could be open to very interesting hermeneutical debates, um, um, but I'm not going to dwell on this um, in any more detail. Um, although I, I would like to stress to two more things here. Um, the first one, um, even though historical critical interpretations aren't inherently governed by um, religious concerns, um, I don't think that means, in my view at least, that they're therefore governed by anti-religious concerns. Um, I mean, so that does seem to be an alternative understanding of, among some scholars, and some of my colleagues, for instance, um, according to which a truly critical perspective on the Bible or on the Quran will inevitably be one that discredits beliefs that Jews, Christians, and Muslims have tended to have about these texts. Um, so that's not my perspective. Um, I, I don't think that historical criticism is inevitably iconoclastic. I mean, it can be, um, there's no insurance against that, um, but I think it may sometimes equally well turn out to be the case that a historical critical interpreter will end up discovering something about a text that ends up confirming aspect of, uh, aspects of traditional belief or um, that he or she will end up discovering something about a text that is at least useful of, or of interest to, um, to a believer. And of course, a historical critical interpreter might himself or herself be a believer. Um, um, so one example for that would be the, um, you know, the long debate question of the date of the Quran. Um, when did the Quran um, reach its final shape? Um, you know, was that um, with the death of Muhammad or much later, maybe perhaps under the Umayyads. I'm very happy to consider the basic possibility that the, um, the fixation of the text of the Quran lasted for a couple of decades after the death of Muhammad. I think that should be an open question as long as we are debating it from the historical critical perspective. But I think the balance of historical probability is, is overall in favor of the hypothesis um, that the Quran as we know it had come into existence by about 650 at the latest, um, and that most of the Quran is in fact um, material that emerged during the prophetic activity of Muhammad in Mecca and Medina in the early 600s. Now that's not entirely the same as saying that all of the Quran consists in the unaltered words of the prophet Muhammad as, as conveyed to him by divine revelation, but it's obviously also not a radically different scenario for the Quran's genesis. So it's fairly close to the traditional narrative. Um, but I, I would say that there's um, very good historical arguments for that. Um, so that was my first remark um, on iconoclasm. Um, the second one, um, uh, simply to say that I take it that a suitably refined version of historical criticism needs to have an important literary dimension built into it. Um, so I take it that both the Bible and the Quran are sophisticated literary compositions. They were successful in part because they're that. Um, and uh, I think we therefore need to devote some effort to understanding how um, biblical and also Quranic texts worked as literature. Um, so I, I don't think a literary approach to the Quran is something that is um, necessarily outside the remit of historical criticism. OK, so much for historical criticism. Now, um, um, tafsir, um, some of the abiding values of um, the hermeneutics of tafsir um, with which I would be happy to identify myself. Um, so first of all, there's, I think, um, everybody who's you know, read a bit of Tabari and Zanakhshari and um, other um, luminaries of the exegetical tradition would agree. Um, there's a great deal of exegetical care that is being lavished on, on every word and phrase of uh, scripture. Um, and, and that is grounded in an assumption of relevance and meaningfulness or religiously put maybe in, in the sort of semantic inexhaustibility of, of the divine word. Um, and, and, I mean, even very subtle nuances of diction and grammar have meaning. Um, the wording of the Quran isn't just one way of conveying meaning that's essentially as good as others. Um, now, obviously, this assumption of semantic fecundity or inexhaustibility um, is usually grounded in um, 
in theological premises, but I, I think there's a way of transferring this basic stance onto a more theological neutral plane, um, simply by, by taking it to inculcate a very healthy default attitude of, of not dismissing an ancient text too early, of, of not prematurely writing it off as, as crude in form and content or as unsophisticated or repetitive. So, so that kind of heightened sense of hermeneutic charity of assuming that whatever the text is saying, it's saying something that's worthwhile explicating, um, something that must have, deemed, uh, must have been um, compelling to its addressees. I, I think that is uh, an assumption on which maybe even the historical critical interpreters could, could agree on uh, together with their um, um, forebears in the Tafsir tradition. Um, that can go too far, maybe. It can go off in the wrong direction. Um, we can talk about it in the, in the Q&A, but, but I think as a default stance, I, I think it's, it's a very good starting point. Um, second vital trait of a lot of Tafsir literature um, that um, scholars like um, Norman Calder, Peter Heath, or more recently Thomas Bauer have written about, um, is the ability of many Mufassirun to navigate and accept conflicting interpretations. Um, so the point of the genre isn't, and in a way it, it couldn't be, to produce one uniquely true restatement of the content of the Quran um, that is more yeah. readily intelligible than the original and, and, and which could, in a way, therefore, substitute, uh, replace the Quran. Um, so a lot of tafsir is polyvalent. Um, there's more than one valid um, interpretation in play often and um, an exploratory. Um, in, in a lot of I, you know, the kind of tafsir that I like, um, somebody like Razi, for instance, um, the point is more to suggest plausible, valid ways of looking at the text and indeed um, just simply looking at the text rather than harnessing the text to a, to a fixed and theological, uh, to a fixed theological and, and legal agenda. Um, I mean, you get that too in a lot of Jewish, Christian, Islamic exegesis, but um, but I think good good tafsir and, and, and good scriptural hermeneutics more generally um, has this sort of um, atmosphere of exploration about it, which um, I, I think is, is rooted in what I've called the unthetic um, quality of commentary writing in general. Um, so I'd like to take comfort from Tafsir literature that, that there's really no need for commentators um, to gloss over the, the considerable uncertainty involved in interpretation and, and to deny that there might be more than one valid view on a given verse. Um, whereas I think maybe in, in contemporary sort of academia, um, there is often an expectation that we will um, prove our own thesis beyond any reasonable doubt and, um, um, and completely rule out alternative um, perspectives. I, I, I don't think it has to be like that, and I think Tafsir is a useful reminder that it doesn't have to be. Um, and finally, um, third point, Tafsir brings different disciplines together in the common matrix of scripture. Um, um, which also touches on my earlier remarks about the format of a commentary. Um, so Norman Calder, in um, in an essay on um, tafsir, uh, described this once as playing across disciplines. So you might have a grammatical problem with a verse, and that might receive a theological solution, or maybe there's a theological query um, to which a verse gives rise, and that's being solved by means of a grammatical or rhetorical analysis. Um, and this cross-disciplinary dimension of, of Tafsir, I, I, to me, remains an inspiring model of um, bringing things together that um, um, I, I think can carry over in sort of historical critical commentary writing, even if what maybe um, a historical critical interpreter might want to bring together or integrate um, are likely to be very different disciplines from what, what you get in, um, in pre-modern um, exegesis. Um, and I, I think um, that is actually a good sort of diagnosis of where we're at with the Quran. I think modern scholarship has now developed and honed some, I think, vital methodological tools permitting a multidimensional reading of the Quran, but um, these tools have not yet been applied, certainly to the longest and most complex surahs in the corpus, and, and their surah too just is the ultimate benchmark. I mean, it's by far the longest text in the Quran, 7% of the corpus, so um, if you can get an exegetical handle on that, then I, I, I think you're um, you're probably equipped for the rest of the Quran as well. Um, so I, I, I thought that in the kind of main part of my talk, I'd simply run, run you through 
three main interpretive axes of analysis that I'm interested in uh, cultivating in, in my commentary and give you a few examples for each. Um, so firstly, there's a literary dimension, um, which I've already alluded to. Um, that's a domain where I think there's been very significant progress since the 1980s, um, spurred by the absolutely seminal work of, of scholars like Angelika Neubert, my own doctoral supervisor, um, or Neil Robinson and Matt Zarnessa in particular. Um, I think the basic questions in, in the domain of literary analysis still revolve around questions of literary structure in particular. So what holds the Quranic Surah together and you know, how do individual verses combine to form larger verse groups, um, surah panels and entire surahs? Um, and I think it's fair to say that as a result of the work done by scholars like Moivet or Robinson, the view that surahs don't usually hold together above the verse level is, is certainly not the default stance anymore. Um, I think for the short Meccan surahs, that's fairly easy to demonstrate. But, but again, um, what about surah two? Um, um, and the other sort of long Medinan compositions, they, they do pose particular challenge, challenges to the quest for Quranic structure. Now, we do now have a number of very good structural analyses of Surah al-Baqarah in particular, because um, um, it, it has tended to be um, perceived as a, as a challenge to a structural analyses by other scholars uh, as well. Um, these analyses do tend to come in the form of articles, book chapters, um, or monographs, though. Um, so, static forms of writing. Um, um, so, they are invariably slightly selective and, and they tend to have a macro structural focus. I mean, they don't go through the entire text, you know, bit by bit as Tabari would. Um, so one of the guiding interests of my commentary would be to kind of think through the structure of Surah al-Baqarah in, in full detail. Um, um, as with other Quranic surahs, I think a, a very good basic assumption is that we ought to think in terms of more than one structural tier. Um, certainly for a text as long and complex as, as the long Medinan surahs. Um, um, so I think uh, three tiers will do the job. So um, above, three tiers above the verse level, that is. So uh, verses, I think, can be seen as clustering together into paragraph-like verse groups. Um, these verse groups then form more extended subsections, and several such subsections will then form larger surah parts or panels. And so the slide you're currently seeing is a basic overview of my current understanding of the, uh, the structure of Surah al-Baqarah that, that gives you uh, an overview of the top two tiers of um, structural organization. So the, the panels, um, so the four or five main parts of the Surah, and then the subsections making up these parts. Um, you don't have the, um, um, the lowest level of organization the um the verse groups because um there would be too many of those um now this kind of map of the surah owes a lot especially to neil robinson um so it's kind of a selective a synthetic distillation of um of, of previous work that's been done um so like many other scholars um i would identify verses 40 to 123 of 123 of surah the baqarah as, as forming an overarching surah panel um because these verses mostly have a shared thematic focus on the Israelites, um, the Banu Israel, um, and, and that, um, that portion of the surah is moreover bounded by a literary bracket, which I'll get to in a moment, that um, uh, Naveen Rida in, in particular has um, written about. Um, I think the um, best way to kind of work out the structure of a long surah um, is to begin by trying to discern major caesurae, uh, major breaks between the different surah panels, and then try to try to identify minor breaks, minor caesurae, um, um, as it were, paragraph breaks within these panels. Um, and so my commentary will try to do uh, most of that in an introdu introductory section towards the beginning of each surah commentary, and then also in separate introductions for each surah panel. Um, and, and that will then be followed by a translation and a verse by verse commentary. And I'll, I'll show uh, one or two examples for that towards the end. Um, so to give one example um, for what these structural overviews will do, um, again, I, um, I take up the, uh, the observation of many earlier scholars that um, there are significant overlaps between verse 40, um, which is 
the opening verse of the second surah panel um, and verses 47 and 122, um, as well as between verses 48 and 123 at the very end of the second panel. So the overlapping bits here are are in yellow, <coughs> excuse me, are in yellow. And and I accept Naveen's argument that the um, sort of the reprise of verses 47 and 48 at the end of the second panel in, in 122 and 123 um, signal the end of the, uh, the second panel. So you sort of circle back to something um, that was said um, early on at the beginning of that panel. Um, so that's um, what scholars call it, an inclusio, a literary bracket. Um, and then that coincides with a palpable thematic shift in verse 124. So you get a coincidence of um, a structural marker and a thematic shift that nicely demarcates that second panel of Surat al-Baqarah. Al um, so that's the, um, the the bracket that demarcates the second panel as a whole, which is on the left of my slide, um, 47, 48, reprised at the very end in 122, 123. Um, I would then further suggest that um, the, the reprise of verse 40 in verse 47 um, um, is best construed as another bracket or inclusio that demarcates the, the first um, verse group of the second panel. Um, so the second panel begins with a quasi paragraph that is bracketed, um, and then the entire panel of which this is the verse the, the initial verse group is also um, demarcated by a bracket. Um, note that there's a structural ambiguity here. So in principle, um, I mean, verses 47 and 48 um, could in principle also be deemed to open the second verse group of the panel rather than, uh, rather than concluding the first one, right? So um, in, in the um, slide, I count verse 49 as the opening verse of the second verse group of this second panel, but you know who's to say that maybe um, it shouldn't be 47, 48 that open that second panel. So it's considerations like those that require fairly um, um, meticulous and sort of detailed consideration of, of various literary markers in the introductory sections of, of my commentary. And um, I have things to, to, to say on that, but, um, but there's usually more than one, um, at least, candidate for a plausible analysis. And so I, I think it's important to sort of talk these options through and to uh, lay out reasons why you position uh, the paragraph break between verses 48 and 49, for instance, rather than 46 and 47. Um, it's not enough to simply posit that that's where it goes, because obviously all of this is interpretive. I mean, it's not in the text. We need to um, develop an argument one way or another. Um, something else that I then discuss in these um, structural overview sections would be the internal organization of the four main surah panels. Um, so the second one, I would argue, has two subsections or two wings, um, one from verse 40 to 74, um, the other from 75 to 123. Again, one needs to sort of talk through all the different markers, you know, um, sectioning devices, thematic shifts that might point one way or another. Um, and again, there's um, potential ambiguity there. So um, both before and after verse 75, um, for instance, there's a long sequence of verse initial wa'id reminiscences. So these are all the verses that, that open with wa'id, um, which I would translate as, and remember when. So it's a, it's a sort of um, flashback to a specific scene set in the, in the past. Um, and um, that's clearly a major feature of the second surah panel. I mean, this sequence of wa'id, wa'id, wa'id um, really ties together the entire second panel of the surah. Um, but that um, also straddles um, what I would argue is the border between the second, the, between the first and the second half of the panel, right? So, which I would locate in, um, in verse 74, 75. Um, that's why I think one could arguably um, locate the boundary between the two wings of the second panel, but these wa'id, wa'id uh, reminiscences certainly continue right across that boundary. So, uh, so that creates um, at least a prima facie impression of continuity that sort of 
is slightly in tension with um, the argument that we can um, locate a neat boundary between these two halves. So that again would need to be um, discussed and, 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 and appropriately sort of talked through. Um, I think it's possible to argue that there's a primary focus of counting incidents from the time of the mosaic Israelites in the first half of the panel, and then there's a predominant though not exclusive interest in, in the behavior of contemporary Israelites and Jews and Christians from verse 75 onwards. Um, but they certainly also um, show affinity in so far as you, you, you keep getting these historical reminiscences. Um, so structural considerations of that sort um, will make up quite a bit of the space that I devote to literary issues. Um, they don't exhaust them. Um, so another, um, the second general area of interest to me under the sort of um, subheading literary analysis would be um, recurrent language and its role in uh, generating cohesion between non-neighboring surah parts, so repeated language. Um, that's something on which Neil Robertson and Mariana Klar in particular have written, and I'm, I'm trying to make sure to tap into their insights as much as possible. Um, um, I think um, it's demonstrable that the opening panel of uh, the surah uh, does introduce important diction and themes that go on to resonate through the entire remainder of the uh, composition. So one example would be um, um, the command that is addressed to Adam and his spouse in verse 35 to uh, eat of the abundance of the primordial paradise. Um, oh, excuse me. Um, and, and following that, the surah features multiple instances of divine invitations to eat that are directed both at the, the Israelites um, in verses 57, 58, and so on, um, and then later on also at the Quran's contemporaries, uh, for instance, 168. I mean, there are further um, recurrences. They don't all fit um, on the same slide. But but I think it's fair to say that verse 35 establishes kind of this aspect of munificence, of divine generosity as a, as a primordial um, dimension of, of the way God deals with humankind. Um, and that then sets an important theme for the rest of the composition. Um, so that's been observed before. That's in uh, an article by Mariana from a few years ago. Um, but I think that would need to be sort of duly taken into, into account. So what does this mean for um, uh, for the meaning of particular sections in, in the surah? Um, so I guess like a Mufassar who assumes that there's meaning and subtle details, um, um, I'm pretty sure that these recurrences aren't coincidental. I mean, they signify something. They, they do need to be taken seriously. They are, I think, deliberate literary markers. Um, one aspect, for instance, instance where recurrence is clearly um, essential to the message of the surah is, is those verses that apply parallel language to the ancient Israelites and to the, to the contemporary Quranic believers. Um, I think that do, does add up to the message that, that basically the, um, the believers around Muhammad are now bidden to do a, a better job at sort of heeding um, God's covenant than their Israelite forebears. And, and that is effectively underscored by um, um, by the use of parallel language. Um, so that needs to be registered um, with some care, I think. Um, okay, so uh, so much on literary analysis. Um, to move on to um, my second axis, um, intertextual contextualization, um, um, trying to sort of um, shed light on the Quran by drawing on, on earlier or contemporary texts in um, Aramaic, Hebrew, or Greek, so rabbinic and Christian texts, but also um, maybe early Arabic poetry, um, Arabian epigraphy, whatever is relevant. Um, I, I think here there is a significant methodological um, discrepancy between historical critical scholarship and, and pre-modern Islamic approaches. Um, I mean, many of us is, of course, perfectly happy and quite rightly so to, to cite verses of Arabic poetry, um, which, which I do think is perfectly apt. Um, but um, a Mufassar will rarely venture into pre-Quranic literatures, even though um, um, Walid Saleh has taught us that um, Al-Biqa'i has made sort of innovative use of, of the Arabic Bible for exegeting the Quran. So, so even there, the discontinuity is by no means um, complete. Um, this type of intertextual contextualization has obviously been a mainstay of work done over the last 25 years which in turn draws on much older European scholarship dating back to the 19th and the early 20th centuries. Um, I, I think it can 
safely be taken for granted that intertextual work of this kind um, is now part of the state of the, the art, basically, of historical critical Quran scholarship. Um, um, and the, um, the basic approach that I think um, scholars now now adopt is to take these continuities for granted, but but then also to stress that um, the Quran makes use of these earlier traditions um, and inflects them, modifies them in theologically innovative ways. So the, um, I guess, slightly reductionist use of pre-Quranic material that one finds in older European scholarship, I, I think that has certainly tended to um, go out of the window slightly. Um, and there's no need to assume that um, an intertextually sensitive reading of the Quran will end up making it look basically just like a um, an echo chamber. Um, I personally think that on the intertextual front, I mean, I think Quranic scholarship is in a comfortable state of solidification. I think um, there's a sort of law of um, diminishing return that is starting to kick in. I think most of the low hanging fruit has been picked. Um, um, I do think there are other forms of Quranic scholarship that are um, more dynamic, um, but it's nonetheless important to pay attention to this. Um, to give one example, um, one of the important keywords across Surah 2 is the notion of concealment, um, katana. Um, my slide again shows you as many of the relevant verses that I could fit onto one slide. Um, um, there are more, uh, so this keeps coming up. Um, it's obviously a sort of a key, um, uh, I guess, um, key aspect of the polemical um, arsenal that the Quran deploys against, uh, or Surah Al-Baqarah in particular deploys against Jews and Christians. Um, um, of particular interest is the collation of Katama and al haq uh, concealing the truth, um, which is found prominently towards the beginning of the second surah, panel in verse 42, um, and then again later on in 146. Um, there's a fascinating article from 2010 where Gabriel Reynolds um, has looked at the Quranic use of, of tropes that derive from Christian anti-Jewish polemics, um, and the uh, accusation that the, the Israelites or the scripture owners more generally are guilty of concealing the truth, um, that is certainly one case in point. Um, so among the evidence that um, Gabriel um, quotes is a passage from the Syriac uh, Christian author Jacob of Saruk, which um, denounces Jewish scribes for hiding the truth, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Um, so the three main conceptual um, components of verse 42 um, can be mapped onto this um, Syriac text, um, um, which I've got on, on the slide there with um, underlinings um, um, beneath the corresponding Syriac terms. Um, so I think it's um, it's clear that um, there's um, a shared conceptual um, armory here. Um, um, now for Jacob of Saruk, the Syriac author, the um, the error in question, that you know, the, the error that he criticizes, is of course um, what he considers to be the Jewish unwillingness to acknowledge that the true meaning of the Old Testament is the enunciation of Jesus Christ. I mean, that's what he means by um, charging um, the Jews with um, knowing concealment of the truth. Um, and the Quran then transfers a comparable accusation of concealment, um, not only to Jewish, but by expansion also Christian disagreement with core teachings of the Quran. Um, um, so the meaning of the accusation uh, changes quite significantly, and, and it's certainly expanded to uh, target not only um, Jews, but also Christians. And in a way, I, I do find it quite entertaining when the Quran uses Christian polemical we weaponry against Christianity itself. I think there's more than one um, case for that. Um, now, just as there can be conflicting structural markers that you know, in favor or against a particular section break. break. Um, so the intertextual material um, can also pull into different directions. And again, that is an occasion where I think a commentator will need to be um, you know, appropriately um, detailed on um, discussing the pros and cons of a particular view. So one example for that would be um, verse 93 um, of Surah al-Baqarah again, where um, it is said that the Israelites um, um, so literally, they were made to drink the calf in their hearts. Um, and that phrase has sometimes been taken to reflect the biblical scene in, in Exodus 32, 
um, where Moses burns the golden calf, um, he grinds it down, he scatters it in water, and then he forces the Israelites to drink it um, as a sort of you know, penalty for, for their idolatry. Um, so that's one reading of what it might mean to say that their hearts were made to drink the calf. Um, um, now, there is another verse in uh, in the Quran, Surah 20, um, um, where the destruction of the calf is described, but, but it only says that the, the ashes of the calf were scattered in the sea. There's no reference to drinking there. Um, um, so that's prima facie a problem with the intertextual link I've just proposed. Um, um, and also on this sort of biblicizing interpretation of, of the phrase here, uh, they were made to drink the calf. Um, it would remain slightly uh, obscure why the verse under discussion refers specifically to the Israelites' hearts. Um, so on, on balance, I think these difficulties um, tip me away from, from a biblical, biblicizing interpretation of this phrase. And um, I would side with an alternative reading that um, Tillmann Seidensticker um, once put forward in, in a German monograph. Um, so he had used a number of early Arabic proof texts in which the passive Ushreba, um, so was made to drink in connection with the word halb, heart, um, is really best translated as an idiom, meaning something like to be thoroughly permeated by, you know, by suspicion, by temptation, or by love. Um, um, so I think that is probably um, a more convincing a construal of the phrase, to take it as an idiomatic figure of speech, rather than as an allusion to the occurrences that are related in, in Exodus 32, you know, the grinding down and the drinking of the calf. Um, and such a figurative or idiomatic reading, I think also creates a far better fit with the context of the verse um, and um, and also with the um, presence of a reference to hearts, which, which is another theme of our sort of Bakala, the, the state of human hearts keeps coming up. Um, so the case of drinking the calf, I think illustrates quite, near, uh, quite nicely that um, that some proposed biblical parallels or sort of pre-Quranic parallels can turn out to be duds or false friends. Um, so they need to be need to be carefully and, and critically weighed. And, and sometimes um, I, I think they can be shown to be not, not really relevant um, on a case-by-case -case basis, obviously. Um, right, so the third axis um, of my commentary, um, I would call diachron diachronic and redactional analysis. <clears throat> um, by that, I mean, Sort of tentative explorations of the relative chronology, the temporal sequence of different Quranic passages, um, um, and and also tentative explorations of how the text of Surah Al-Baqarah might have evolved over time um, before finally stabilizing into the, um, the, the canon canonical version of the Surah that, that we have. Um, now, I'm I'm assuming um, that a composition that is as complex as Surah Al-Baqarah um, was not simply written down or promulgated in, in one go in its present form. Um, now, if, if one were to posit, or if one posits, that the Quran is the product of a divine author, of course, it is in principle conceivable that a Surah al-Baqarah was promulgated in, in one go. So um, certain theological premises, if they're brought into play, will sort of undermine that, uh, that, that basic supposition of mind that the text might have undergone development over time. But um, as, as many of you will know, um, the Islamic tradition is actually quite happy to assume that Quranic surahs contain verses from different periods in the Prophet's life, um, that more recently revealed verses were added to already existing surahs. So, so in a way, that is a concern, the concern with sort of textual development over time is a concern that is by no means alien to, um, to tafsir. Um, attempting to reconstruct such textual revision and insertions over time on the basis of careful observations of stylistic, radiological, and, and maybe even theological discrepancies, tensions, differences, is something that biblical scholars have done basically for centuries. Um, and I'm very interested in sort of probing the extent to which it's possible to apply similar um, investigations to the Quran. Um, so can we identify verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, for instance, that are likely to be chronologically later than, than their literary environment? Um, can we perhaps even surmise how Surah al-Baqarah evolved from an earlier, much uh, smaller textual nucleus into its, its present uh, form? Um, I think this this axis of study is um, considerably less developed than the, the previous two. Um, 
so the literary and the textual dimensions. Um, I mean, there's some relevant work by scholars like Richard Bell um, or more recently Karl Friedrich Pohlmann in, in German. Um, but I do have significant reservations about the approaches of, of both of them. So I think that needs to be um, critically reevaluated. Um, maybe one remark to make in this context is um, to say that I actually think it's perfectly plausible that a significant amount of such revision would have taken place during Muhammad's lifetime. Um, so Pohlmann um, takes for granted that any sort of scribal revision um, whereby a verse maybe is embedded into an earlier surah basically must postdate the death of Muhammad because he very much thinks in terms of a neat sequence of prophetic proclamation and scribal revision that I think works for the Bible. Um, I, I'm very doubtful that um, for the Quran, we can safely assume that these are two distinct stages. I don't see why they might not have gone on at the same time. Um, I, I don't think one can rule out from the start that there might be individual verses in the Quran that date to the early post-prophetic period. Um, I don't think there's compelling proof for it at the moment. Um, I think one can like argue for the likelihood of such a scenario in specific cases. Um, it would be odd for a historical critical interpreter to dismiss the possibility from the start, but um, it's usually not possible to sort of um, mount a compelling proof, uh, I don't think. Um, now, um, this diachronic and reductional axis of interpretation does strike me as an exciting forefront of Quranic research, but I think it's fair to say that its results are often bound to be um, much more speculative and tentative than those uh, of the preceding two axes. Um, I think usually we can at most catch glimpses of how the final form of a given surah might have evolved from prior ones. Um, um, so just as a relative chronology of Quranic surahs, I think ultimately remains a hypothesis. So the redactional reconstruction of the textual development of a given surah, I think, will remain hypothetical, um, which is why I do think that the starting point and the end point of our analyses does need to be the canonical version of the Quran um, as we have it as a whole and, and of individual surahs as, as we have as we have them. Um, uh, so I think a useful motto here is the title of a 2017 article by Mariana Klar, which speaks of combining synchronicity with diachronicity. Um, in line with what I think is, is actually best practice in biblical scholarship. Um, so you start out with a canonical version of a surah in its canonical position in the Quran as we have it. Um, you train yourself to be sensitive to observations that might allow you to speculate responsibly about prior stages in the gestation of the text. And then you seek to understand how and why the text might have developed from such a putatively prior stage to its canonical one. Um, so for instance, um, in positing that a given verse is or contains a later addition to a surah, I think a very basic rule um, is always to come up with a reasonably convincing explanation for why a conjectured insertion was supposedly made in the first place. I mean, why was a verse added um, um, to a surah, if, if that's what you're, you're positing? And, and by reasonably convincing, um, I don't mean basically stuff got mixed in at a random place, which is kind of what Richard Bell ends up doing. Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with his um, translation from the 1930s, where mm -hmm. there's a sort of a lot of um, 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 redactional um, sort of conjectures about verses not belonging to a particular context. But but usually the explanation that he offers is, oh, it's a scrap. It just ended up here um, you know, for haphazard reasons. Um, I don't think that's good enough as a sort of um, as a compelling explanation for why something was added where it um, is assumed to have been added. Um, um, so I think here, um, given the sort of openness and uncertainty of, of these sort of redactional explanations, kind of the uh, Tosir inspired stance of tolerating indeterminacy and polyvalence is, is again um, very healthy. Um, two brief examples for that. Um, one would be verse 62 of the Surah. Um, the believers, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, whoever believes in God and in the final day and does righteous deeds, they will have their wage with God and they will have nothing to be afraid of and will not know grief. Um, so this statement has a doublet, meaning an almost identical parallel in Surah 5, verse 69. Um, um, not just kind of at first blush, um, I do think it's fair to say that verse 62 
reads like an interruption in the sequence of historical reminiscences of comments in verse 49, and all those statements in introduced by Wa'id and remember when, um, and then continue on in verse 63. And, and theologically too, um, the verse um, certainly forms an interesting counterpoint to, um, um, to the predominantly negative uh, assessment of the Israelites in the verses that precede. Um, so according to verse 62, it's apparently perfectly conceivable that Jews, or for that matter, Christians and Sabians, might come to qualify as, as righteous believers who will be rewarded in the hereafter. So in a way, verse 62 offsets the impression emerging from the surrounding text that um, um, basically Israelite disobedience is, is constant and ineluctable. Um, so despite everything, it seems to be entirely possible for the descendants of the ancient Israelites to kind of live up to God's demands. Um, so there's an ecumenical note here that is um, not necessarily a downright contradiction with um, the surrounding text, but, but certainly is slightly out of tune with the stridency of, of the textual environment uh, of this verse. Um, although one must say that the other verses in Surah 2, uh, two um, um, where the text avoids a sort of conspicuously avoids a wholesale condemnation of the Israelites and it only po polemicizes quite expressly against a group, a fariq of them. So um, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say that there's a contradiction here, but, but um, there's a sort of an interesting um, um, countervailing note to um, a lot of the surrounding material. Um, now, um, also the collective names, the Jews, the Christians, they haven't really, they, they kind of slightly pop up out of nowhere here. Um, not certain what that means, but um, um, that's an additional observation one might make. Um, now, if we had time to look at the doublet of this verse in Surah 5, I think it would be possible to show that there the verse um, is integrated much more organically into its immediate literary context than in Surah 2. Um, it really grows out of the preceding and sort of caps up, caps off um, uh, things that are said before, um, whereas here it just kind of um, appears out of nothingness. Um, uh, so I think to me it's plausible to um, consider verse 62 to be a sort of a secondary reprise of 569. Um, um, so um, an important theological statement in another surah is taken up and as it were cited in surah 2. And I think that there's more than one case of that. Um, uh, so there's an interim conclusion here, which, which would be that 262 is diachronically later than 569. It sort of presupposes 569 because 569 grows out of its context and 262 doesn't really. Um, um, now this diachronic judgment doesn't as such have reductional implications yet. I mean, it's entirely compatible as such with the possibility that 262 is original to the surrounding passage, that it was always part of that uh, stretch of text. But again, there are these indications of a sort of relative disconnectedness of verse 62 um, with regard to its context. So I would cautiously incline towards the conjecture that 62 is indeed a secondary addition to um, its context, um, which serves to inscribe the more ecumenically open perspective that is formulated in Surah 5 into a sequence of historical reminiscences about the ancient Israelites that could otherwise be understood um, as placing all Israelites past and present beyond any hope of salvation. Um, again, there's no conclusive proof here that verse 62 is secondary, and even if it is secondary, um, it might perfectly well date to the um, time of the prophet. Um, but I think the general phenomenon of secondary insertions and revision demonstrably does, does exist in the Quran. Um, and so it seems quite likely that it would also have occurred in a very extended composition like like Surah 2. Um, um, so I devote some space to exploring cases of revision like that. Um, um, maybe to give you a very brief account uh, or a very sort of brief impression of a second example, um, just a snapshot. So this is verse 102, um, uh, the verse about Harut and Marut. Um, which comes in a passage that attacks the scripture owners, or, or rather a group of them, um, um, and accuses them of abandoning God's scripture. So that's in verse 101. And then um, the chief point made in 102 is that 
um, the scripture owners prefer sorcery over adherence to God's scripture. Um, so I think that that is the within its context that is the main argumentative function of the verse. Um, but the verse is extremely long. It it runs to three times the length of the previous verse. Um, it gives a lot of addition over and above the basic message that I've just summarized. Um, so the verse seems to allude to the phenomenon of late antique Jewish magic, um, which is well attested um, by means of incantation bowls. Um, the verse constructs a sort of etiology um, of Jewish magical practices as going back to two angels called Harut and Marut via demonic instruction. Um, Harut and Marut obviously are interesting names. They seem to ultimately go back to two Zoroastrian divine entities, although here they are identified as angels. Um, and, and this basic etiology, um, this account of the emergence of Jewish magic, um, it is really a, an interesting complex balancing act between potentially conflicting objectives here. So on the one hand, um, the text insists that efficacious magical law, sort of magic that works, um, ultimately goes back to divine instruction, um, in which is patently in, in keeping with the um, Quran's monotheistic creed that God alone possesses unrivaled power. So there's no um, competing principle of evil to which one might um, ascribe magic. Um, God is the fount of all knowledge. So that's one concern that um, this verse, I think, has. But on the other hand, crucial figures or way stations in the transmission of magic here are exonerated from, from any moral impropriety. So the angels Harut and Marut, but also Solomon. Um, they're not, in a way, liable for the um, um, nefarious uses to which magic might be put. So it, it's really, it, it's a very complex, uh, very interesting, fascinating verse. Um, now, given its conspicuous length, given its theological complexity, um, given the, facts, uh, the, the fact that it uh, contains three striking, as you know, we say, hapax legomena, words that occur nowhere else in the Quran, Harut, Marut, and Babylon. Um, so three terms that have a clear Mesopotamian um, cultural context. Um, given all of that, I am strongly inclined to a reductional analysis of this verse. And I, I would posit that the present form of the verse is the outcome of, of two different layers of insertions. Um, and the way I would tentatively envisage the way this verse has, has come to be um, would be um, from an earlier nucleus um, that basically consists of the beginning and the end of the verse um, that um, is limited to the accusation that the scripture owners followed the magical law that other Quranic passages associate with Solomon's demonic helpers. Um, um, this um, nucleus, which rhymes and you know is lengthwise perfectly um, inconspicuous in its context, was then expanded by the first insertion that I think was placed in the middle, um, um, which serves to exonerate Solomon um, and, and also to spell out that magic is only effective because God allows it to be effective. And then th there's a, a third um, layer, sort of a second layer of insertion, um, at which point Harut and Marut um, are introduced. Um, I mean, that's one way of looking at the verse. Um, I understand that Paul Neuenkirchen is also working on this verse. Um, um, I think he's got a very different sort of reductional model. Um, so again, there's sort of reason to be a tolerant of indeterminacy and openness. But but I think there's value in sort of exploring um, how a verse as complex as this might have re reached its, its present version. Um, right. So those um, were my examples. I, um, I should probably start wrapping up now. Um, um, ba -ba -bum. One issue that I'm still grappling with is the use to make in concrete terms of pre-modern tafsir literature. I, I do think it's important to sort of use it as secondary literature. Um, I don't think it can be ignored. Um, that will require me to be very selective and um, I'm not entirely sure what the principles of selection should be here. I mean, I think there's a lot of sort of insight into grammatical and linguistic issues. Um, so I'll have to find out a way to figure out a way of, of sort of drawing on, on the corpus of Tafsir without drowning in it because there's so much of it. Um, um, that's, that's an open question. Um, before um, sort of handing the word again over to you, um, maybe just two or three examples of what this might look like in the end, um, the structure and the layout. Um, uh, as I've hinted, um, 
I'm planning to sort of, or I, I have um, separate structural um, overviews at the beginning of each surah and then also at the beginning um, of each of the main um, sections or panels um, of uh, Surah al-Baqarah at least, um, where I discuss issues of uh, literary sectioning in, in particular. Um, that um, is then followed by um, a translation with very extensive notes um, um, that will look like this. Um, so it's important to me um, to even make it very clear just from the layout alone that my commentary is subservient to the text. So um, so the Quran will be above the line as it were, and then there's going to be um, a verse by verse commentary below the line. Um, in many cases, um, there'll just be pages and pages of footnotes because um, a verse might give um, rise to sort of multiple questions and, and, and sort of masail as um, Razi would say. Um, um, but, but I think um, it's possible to sort of um, present that in a way that doesn't create too much um, confusion. Uh, so that's another example. Um, so again, here's the Quranic text at the top, and then um, there's um, the commentary that goes through the um, component segments of the verse in, in the order. Um, and then at the end, um, obviously, there should be some sort of synthetic attempt at articulating kind of the main argument or message of each of the surah's panels, um, um, which I think um, will largely be based on these sort of philological spade work done in the verse by verse commentary. So a, a section maybe entitled synthesis where I, I just try to sort of basically write a, um, a condensed summary of what's going on in the verse that hopefully would make sense to people who um, don't necessarily have, have all these sort of um, um, philological background or, or in fact the interest or the time to um, to read through the verse by verse commentary. Okay, I'm going to stop here. Um, that was largely what I was right. going to present. And, um, Perfect. Yes. Right, thank you, uh, Dr. Sinai, obviously, for this uh, wonderful insight into a methodological approach. Uh, we now have about half an hour uh, for you to put your question. Obviously, with about over 50 of you, I don't think everybody would be able to do that in, but we will try. Anyway, so I don't see any hands up. Anybody wants? Yeah, you can unmute yourself and ask the question. Uh, I have a yeah. question. Uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sinai, for your presentation. Uh, uh, many times in this presentation, you refer to panels. Could you clearly describe what you mean by panels? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just using it as a fancy word for main uh, surah part. Um, um, <laughs> It just allows me to avoid overusing uh, the word section, right? Obviously, you could speak of small sections, uh, I don't know, intermediate sections and really big sections. Um, so I use panel for um, um, a main, a principal stretch of text. Um, I'm thinking of basically um, a painting um, that might also come in in more than one uh, panel. So um, um, verses 40 to 123, uh, 123 um, um, the long major section on the Israelites, I would call a panel, but I'm not invested in terminology. I mean, if, um, I don't know if, if you feel that the word is actually unhelpful, then I, I'd be happy to rethink it. Um, alternatively, I should probably just, um, yeah, take a paragraph very early on in the book to, to explain what I mean. Uh, it's a use of the word that's, I think, conventional in biblical studies, but I, I do think it's, it's necessary to explain it. Thank you. Great. I see Simon is it's unmuted. Do you want to ask a question? Oh, um, I'm sorry. No, no. All right. Sorry so about that. We've got Sajad, Sayyid Sajad as well. Oh, sorry. Wadi, it seems yes. Wadi, you go ahead. Ah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Professor Simon. Fascinating talk. And um you clearly demonstrated we can get some really great insights using this historical critical uh, method to tafsir um you mentioned that now it's generally become accepted that there is this structure to the quran even with the longer medinan surahs but that wasn't always the assumption in, in western scholarship uh because there's you know 
uh, rapid changes of subject and uh, and even as you, as you mentioned there there's clear examples of um you know verses which are added in you know Med medinan verses in meccan surahs um now now for a muslim we we would believe that this structure you know is intended is fully intended but as a hist looking at it from a historical critical perspective does it look like this structure was pre-planned or does it look like this structure could have been imposed when the the Quran was collected and, and maybe it was organized in that way? Yeah, that's that's a fascinating question. I mean, uh, I guess as a matter of principle, but I'm not entirely sure I'm, I'm going to manage to say this very clearly, but I, I don't think a teleological perspective whereby you bring God into the picture is necessarily opposed to a perspective that looks at change that tracks change over time, because it, it may just be that, you know, what God foresaw and intended was precisely the historical process that, that unfolded. So um, I, I think there's interesting theological ways of sort of reconciling um, the two. So that's, I guess, part of the answer. Um, um, the other part would be for me to say that I, I think structure um, um, sits of you know kind of works out at different levels in in the Quran so I, th I think there's generally a structure to a surah um, um, and even if you can sort of pinpoint certain verses as maybe being secondary um, um, sometimes you can almost argue that in a particular way they actually contribute um, and reinforce structure rather than undermining it um, um, but that that is the surah level um, but, but I think beyond the surah level, um, there's also structure to the Quranic corpus as, as a whole. Um, um, you know, that, that's a, a claim or a perspective that's um, it's sort of in um, sort of more recent times been, um, I think, um, been written about in, in the sort of Indo-Pakistani school of exegesis, people like Islahi and Farahi um, talk about surah pairs. Um, I think some of that is, is actually quite compelling. Um, uh, so there's this phenomenon of keyword concatenation between neighboring surahs. So, you know, sort of um, there's reference um, or there's a, a request for divine guidance at the end of Surah al fatiha and then Surah al baqara owns by saying, well, this is the guidance, uh, things like that. Um, I would tend to think aren't coincidental. Um, um, I think that is kind of the level of structure that might be um, dated to the time of, of the compilation of the Quran. So if, if, certainly if we go by the Islamic tradition, then um, there was more than one way of, um, of sort of compiling the Quran and um, more than one ordering of surahs. Um, as far as we can tell, some of the non-canonical orderings were more um, sort of mechanically um, or quantitatively, quantitatively um, governed simply by decreasing length. Whereas the corpus that we have, I, I think, modifies the basic principle of decreasing length by, by other considerations like surah pairing or keyword concatenation. Um, um, I, I think it's interesting to try to explore that. Um, um, I, I, I would follow the tradition and sort of not attributing that to the prophet. Um, but again, to sort of circle back to the um, first part of my answer, if you wanted to bring God back into the um, picture then I think it would be easy to say well you know the reason why one particular way of organizing the Quran won out over others is that this is in the end the divinely intended outcome of the historical process and and the Quran that we have um, you know maybe superior to others in sort of maximizing coherence between neighboring surahs and, and maybe that's what you know um, yeah. uh, what the divine revelator intended to win out all along um, yeah. um so i i certainly um I, I've, I've come around on, the, uh, on, on this so initially i i thought uh, kind of uh, the sewer level is just basically uh, fantasy and reading into the text but, but uh, i think there's too much there in order to sort of dismiss it and dismiss it entirely um uh, yeah i hope that answers your no, question thank you that, that that did thank you thank you very much because actually if i can just quickly follow up and you, you mentioned that um that there could be examples where um, a late insertion maybe helps reinforce uh, an apparent structure. And may maybe that could be part of the reductional analysis as well. So if, if it looks like an example uh, which doesn't fit, uh, is longer than the rest of the surahs, um, 
maybe part of the reductional analysis could be that if, if it contributes to the to the apparent structure. Yes. So, I mean, my standard example for that when I kind of teach this um, is 73, which has this, I mean, that's kind of the textbook example of, um, I think, um, a Medinan insertion into a Mekansura in the Quran. It's a really, really long verse that is almost as long as the rest of the surah. I think there's multiple observations that converge on making it likely that this is a Medinan insertion into an earlier surah. Um, so there's sort of some stylistic discontinuities, as it were, seems that allows us to speculate that this is maybe later. But then what it also does is it creates a very nice kind of satisfying literary bracket around the surah as a whole, because it circles back to the topic of, of, uh, of no, nocturnal recitation that opens the surah. So at least in one regard, it actually improves structure because you end up with a surah that is nicely bracketed. So I, I think that's an example in point, yeah. Great. Any other question? Still have twenty minutes, so uh, Dr. Sinai, uh, could you uh, um, mention a few works that we can study in order to become more familiar with this topic because for some of us, this is completely new. You mentioned you mentioned a few uh, scholars, if you could, yeah, um yes, so I mean, um. There's a very nice volume by Angelica Neuwert um, that's now been translated into English. Uh, the Quran is a text of late antiquity, I think uh, it's called in English. Um, I think that's OUP, that's been out for a few years. Uh, I mean, that really is a synthesis of kind of a lifetime of research. So I think that that probably would be my kind of um, first port of call for, for her, uh, which uh, I, 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 well, I think has been massively influential, certainly on me. Um, um, there's Neil Robinson's Discovering the Quran, which is now 20 years old, but but I still use that as a textbook. Um, oh, that's a very nice um, uh, introduction to sort of the literary analysis in particular um, of the um, of the long surahs. Um, and if I could sort of toot my own horn, um, that's um, a book I, I wrote a couple of years ago, which mm. basically tries to sort of um, take students through um, what, what I think is kind of um, either very good secondary literature or secondary literature that looks plausible, plausible, but, but you know, is maybe mistaken. Um, um, so I think that that could be used as an introductory reading sort of in, in exploring um, further. Um, so maybe those would be my three initial recommendations. Um, yeah. I'll, um, on the issue of, maybe I'll add a fourth one, on the issue of um, sort of intertextuality and sort of links to biblical and sort of pre-Quranic Christian Jewish literature, there's um, um, Gabriel Reynolds has a sort of a, a commentary on um, um, an English translation of the Quran where he, every time there's sort of a biblical resonance, um, he basically um, explains what it is and, and and he has a brief evaluation. So so I think that could be used as a sort of nice kind of reference work for, um, you know, what does yeah. the Quranic account is of Abraham have in common with the, the Quran and the Bible, yeah? Sorry? It's comparison of the Quran and the Bible, yes? Yeah, it's called the Quran and the Bible text and commentary. Yeah. I think it's very he, he actually contacted me about uh, 12 years ago because he wanted to use the Quran that we had translated at this college. So he, he ended up using Ali Goli Garoy's uh, translation. Yes. So, yeah. Okay, so you were, okay. Uh, I, I wasn't aware of that. That's, that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, so he yeah. ended up using Ali Goli Garoy's translation. Yes, yes, and yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, yeah. Now, are there, are there, uh, uh, reactions from, let's say, orthodox Muslim side to this type of research? Is there any, let's say, uh, resentment that perhaps uh, this is delegi delegitimizing, delegitimizes the uh, Quran? Um, I mean, so far, I guess, I don't know, I, I guess it's um, a lot of what I write in the end, maybe is pretty pedestrian and, and just maybe... <laughs> It doesn't capture headlines. Maybe that protects me. I don't know. Um, 
Um, I've been fine so far. I've got Muslim students who, you know, obviously believe in certain things that I might not believe in, but but I mean, I would always think that as long as one is respectful um, and doesn't um, pretend to have a level of historical certainty to offer that that simply doesn't exist, then it's possible to have a conversation and maybe partially disagree, but but still be illuminated by what the other is saying. Um, um, so I, I, I don't think there's any reason to fear that this is sort of you know, polemically disproving the divine origin of, of the Quran. I don't think that's within the um, remit of scholarship. Um, but I try to sort of balance that by saying that obviously, yes, I mean, I do make certain assumptions that that, that are different from those of you know, either somebody like Al-Tabari or um, maybe even a contemporary Muslim believer. That's fine. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to sort of own up to that. Um, but that I don't think makes me a threat. I mean, ultimately, I, I guess the main response might be one of sort of indifference. I mean, I, I don't pretend that what I'm writing is having a huge impact on you know, what Muslims um, especially in the Islamic world, think and 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 write. Um, that is maybe a bit of a pity because I think it would be nice to actually have more of a conversation going back and forth. Um, um, but but maybe you know that will come. I I don't know. But um, but no, I um, I I, I can't complain. I I don't think there's any reason to see this as particularly threatening. So you have not seen any articles or books written uh, criticizing this approach that you and others have had. No, yes, I have. I mean, you know this. Um, I, I'm aware of one video, for instance, actually by it's an interview where an American colleague complains about um, some of my assumptions um, from, I think, a more traditional viewpoint than um, than mine. Um, that's fine, though. I mean, I, I think within scholarship, that is within the um, you know the limits of, of of the usual that there should be debate and. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I guess uh, I took your question to mean, you know, are there death threats or any of that? Uh, um, and no, um, I, I'm not aware of any Quranic scholar. Um, I suppose it's different. Well, maybe it is different for Muslims, right? Because obviously being a non-Muslim, maybe I'm just not entirely, exp I mean, you know, at most I'm slightly daft. I'm not, I'm not getting it. And so that is something I, I sometimes uh, do encounter, um, you know, when, talking to taxi drivers like okay so you spend all of your life reading the quran but if you're not going to come around if it's not even a viable possibility that you might come around that i mean what's the point of this i mean it's just and you know at, at some level i i get that I, I can understand that um um but but that still isn't um i mean that that still isn't violent reduction um um i i'm okay with that i rather enjoy those conversations actually yeah, my intention was to find out if there are any intellectual, uh, let's say, challenges uh, written, especially in written format. Thank you for your response. No, I'm not aware. Yeah, but um, no, keep looking out. Thanks. Right. Okay. Let's see if anybody else sits on the. Yes, but you again, sure. Why not? There is no other. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take, really take advantage of the professor's time here. Um, no Actually, I, I wonder, um, like there are some, like for um, as Muslims, uh, from a traditional perspective, there, there are some verses that we ponder over, which are puzzling to us. Um, for example, there's, uh, the Quran seems to suggest that um, Maryam is part, Christians believe that she's part of the Trinity, or that Uzair, uh, the Jews believe that Uzair is the, is the son of God. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, traditional Muslims have, have come up with responses to that. I wonder if you have a historical critical uh, view or view on those kind of passages. Yeah, Isaiah, Ezra, that that is a <clears throat> mystery to me. Um, mm. I mean, I, I mean, basically, I think what the Quran is saying must have been plausible enough in its context, in its environment, and I think there's so many. I mean, I think the Quran shows enough signs of a fair, you know a decent awareness of aspects of Christian eschatology and of Christian belief that uh, I don't find it likely that the Quran would have just thrown out some ridiculous misunderstanding. Um, um, I think with Mary, you can sort of make sense of that as a kind of criticism of Christian 
practice at the time because you know there is veneration of Mary even though she's not strictly speaking divine but you know Christians do pray to her so I think I could um um like um um uh, Sydney Griffith or um Gabriel Reynolds I could imagine that what the Quran is doing is simply saying well what you Christians are doing is effectively divinizing Mary that's absurd you should really um check on your own um theological commitments here so so i think there's a degree of polemically motivated exaggeration um in that statement um but but i think it also kind of maps onto things that christians you know did do and and, and are doing so so i think that can be read as actually a serious criticism of um basically what from the chronic perspective would be um grave theological inconsistency on the part of christians who pray to mary and, and simultaneously claim to be monotheists um um Ezra, though, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm still going to talk about because um, <clears throat> Jews just don't really um, um, venerate Ezra um, or divinize Ezra. I mean, maybe there's sort of, you know, certain um, peripheral um, types of literature one could bring in play, but none of what I've seen really elucidates that verse to me. So I think there I'm still kind of holding out for uh, for a solution. Okay. Right. Maybe, maybe I can ask a question as as I'm sharing this. Yes, Professor uh, I was I was wondering. Uh, you, you're familiar with with the with the um, the idea that perhaps the order by which the surah are now universally accepted uh, might have been. Uh, in different forms. What, what what are the implications, for example? You have decided to do a project which starts from, from Surah 1 and, I don't know, 3, maybe 4 or 5. But if the Quran was in a different order, would you have placed a, a different... Um, a, would, have, would you have chosen a particular Surah or just because... Because there, there are, as, as you know, different different uh, theories in, in the way original Muslim had compiled this Quran and obviously offers a, a whole different um, in terms of period the things implication yes yeah I mean I'm, I'm I don't think any of the alternative orderings are you know more original um, than the canonical one so uh, I think it's interesting to note that there was you maybe different possibilities because in a way that makes the present ordering more relevant right because if there's an alternative possibility then some thought must have gone into what we have there must be reasons to explain why what we have in fact won out um so so, so in a way i just take that as encouraging um reflection on um what the principles of ordering in the canonical quran might be um uh, in, ta in terms of a sort of a reordering of surahs i mean um, so Angelica Neuwitz's commentary, which has been published in German, and I think is, is now starting to become available in English. Um, so what she's trying to do, in, in, a, in a way what I was part of uh, at some point, sort of is, is to write a commentary that proceeds in chronological order, that um, mm -hmm. allows a reader to sort of, I guess, um, track the journey of the Quran over time by starting with the early... Meccan surahs and then progressing on and you know on, on to the later Meccan and, and, and the Medinan ones. And I think there's certain there's certainly value in that kind of readerly experience because um I, I I think some things make maybe a lot of sense if you look at them in their putative um diachronic order. Um, um I guess my my worry would now be that no chronology of the Quran is is really more than a hypothesis. So I I don't think this um um, I don't. I don't think it's possible, sort of, to argue with full confidence that Surah X really was later than Surah Y. I think we can offer that as a as a hypothesis, um, but uh, but in many cases we probably can't. So um, I think it's quite a courageous act to tie yourself into that format of kind of reordering surahs chronologically. And um, um, ultimately, I, I don't think it's necessarily uh, unfeasible. Um, um, I guess the reason why I started with one uh, is because, I mean, I, one and two are quite a nice combination. Right? It's a very short surah and the longest surah of the Quran. So if I can come up with a, an exegetical protocol, a way of sort of writing a commentary that 
does justice to both of these texts, then I, I think it could be a prototype for the entire Quran. I mean, I'm, I'm not really tempted to promise that, or certainly not now to kind of, but I'll do all of it. Um, but I, I think it would be useful to sort of have a kind of um, an impression of what it might look like to do all of it, and then maybe other people can do the rest of it. I, I think um, I think we don't have enough commentaries. I think we should have more commentaries. And sure. uh, um, I think this is kind of um, an attempt to sort of develop a format that, that could serve as the kind of framework for the commentary. Right, yes, I've got uh, Simon. Uh, yes, go ahead, Simon. Uh, hi, Nikolai. Um... Feel free to ignore my question because I did actually miss your talk. Um, apologies. <laughs> so I suspect this might have been covered and you just uh, allu allu alluded to it then as well. I was just wondering why, yeah, you actually chose the format of a commentary um, as opposed to, say, a, a more straightforward monograph. Um, like I say, if you've already covered that, please, please ignore me. But I'd be interested as to, yeah, as to why you specifically chose that format. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, 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 sorry, I did talk about that. Um, I yeah. think it's an uh, interesting question. Um, I think commentaries force one to, I don't know, submit to the text and to all of the text uh, in, in a way that I think is very productive. I mean, there's lots of things about the Quran, about Surah 2, that um, I'm learning simply by having to work through all of the text and having to say something, I mean, reasonably intelligent on all of it. Um, I think in a monograph, you can sort of, you obviously you cherry pick your evidence and you talk about the bits that strike you. Um, I think it's nice to sort of be confronted with um, the entire text, even of only part of the Quran. And um, um, I think it makes you notice things that maybe you otherwise wouldn't have noticed. Um, um, I like the fact that commentaries are, um, you know, both unfashionable and kind of the classic rock format of, of scriptural exegesis i mean you know they've been written for centuries if not millennia and i um i think um maybe it's um a partial aberration of literary production that we've abandoned them i think at, at our peril um thank you nicola that's that's very interesting thank you yeah may i ask one last question very quick one it's actually a comment yeah, yeah we have a few more minutes you mentioned that uh, there is no such thing as the chronolog chronological order, uh, but you know those who have done Quranic research, they have come up with a chronological order for the revelation of the uh, verses and the chapters. Uh, are you saying that those are uh, this order is of no value? Yes. No. Um. No, it's uh, complicated. So, um, so there are traditional surrealists. Um, so there's an excellent French dissertation by Emmanuel Stephanidis, which I think is in the works of the book, where she looks at where, where those lists that purport to be chronological, uh, you know, the Meccan surahs in their order, in the order of, of the opening passages and the Medina ones, where those lists emerge and how they develop over time. And, um, 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 and those lists, and I think, um, one needs to recognize then provide the starting point for the famous Meldika Shvali, uh, sorry, um, Vial Meldika chronology of the Quran, um, the famous kind of early, middle, and late Meccan and then Medinan periodization of the Quran. So that builds on these traditional surah lists, but, but tries to basically introduce a dimension of um, sort of stylistic checks and, and balances, because the surah lists are just kind of take it or leave it information right so you get a list ascribed to some early exegetical authority but it's it's not rationalized there's no reasons given you're simply asked to take this on trust well i probably wouldn't take it on trust i would want to um be told why uh, you know sewer 37 is necessarily earlier than sewer 6 and and i think one can make arguments of that sort i've tried to do that myself i i think um, certainly the Meldika chronology um, is to, to, to a, a very significant degree based on increasing verse length. I think that's one um, stylistic criterion that can help date surahs, but um, I, I don't think um, any of those observations necessarily will give us a full chronological sequencing of every surah 
after some other or preceding some other surah. I mean, it's one thing to say, well, you know, surah two is almost certainly significantly later than surah seventy two, um, but it's it's quite another kind of it's 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 a much taller order to commit yourself to um, producing a full breakdown of surahs in their um, chronological sequence. I'm I'm not sure that there's enough. I mean, maybe a computer could do it. I don't know. But even then, you know, who's to say that the premises we give it um, are necessarily the right ones? Who's to say that, I don't know, verse length must grow continually, that there might not be kind of little spikes and and drops along along the way? So I don't think any surah order is kind of set in stone. I, I think they're all kind of theories, and um, we can compare different theories. But uh, I think there's always a degree of uncertainty around that topic, I would say now, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I think we're, we've actually reached 7.30 here in London, which is the end of our uh, timing. Just want to thank Professor Nikolai Sinai for his uh, uh, wonderful insight into this uh, research system. And uh, also want to remind the, the, the participant that if you're interested, in, I'm not sure what the organizers are doing with the recording, uh, but if you're interested in receiving a recording or uh, an address where the recording can be watched, please uh, email. Uh, the organizer directly in Islamic College. Uh, also, if you're interested in future lectures uh, or academic lecture that we are running, please do uh, send your details to our uh, Islamic College address email, and we will put you on the on the list. Again, thank you very much, Professor Sinai, and uh, thanks for having thank you me. for everybody. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Bye. you to all the participants. Bye.